So this week we read Parshat Pinchas. And in it, God issues Moses a word of warning. Your term as the leader of the Israelites is coming to an end, God says. You must step down before reaching the promised land. We learn of Moses's impending death many times in the Torah, and this is just one of those times, but this time Moses responds by requesting the transfer of power. Yifkod Adonai ish al ha'edah, appoint, O oh God, someone over the community. Moses continues, someone who shall go out before them and come in before them and who shall take them out and bring them in so that the Lord's community may not be like sheep that have no shepherd. And God heeds Moses' request, immediately identifying Joshua as Moses' successor. et Yehoshua bin Nun ish asher ruach bo. Take Joshua, son of Nun, a man with spirit in him. Visamachta et yadcha alav and lay your hand upon him. Have him stand before Eleazar the priest and before the whole community and commission him in their sight. Given that we're approaching the 4th of July, this moment in Torah when Moses prepares for his own departure reminded me of another significant moment in American history. Okay, well, to be honest, it reminded me of a scene in the musical Hamilton which is about American history, right? As Lin-Manuel Miranda put it, George Washington's going home. Yes, the announcement of Moses' pending resignation reminded me of George Washington's decision in 1796 to not seek re-election after serving two terms as the first president of the United States. Part of Washington's reasoning for stepping down was that he feared that if he died in office, Americans would see the presidency as a lifetime appointment. So George Washington, like Moses, was also concerned with the transfer of power. When I considered this similarity, both figures stepping down before their deaths and passing off their leadership of fledgling nations, it occurred to me that there are many more similarities between these two forefathers. When called upon to serve, both leaders were hesitant. God tells Moses that he will go before Pharaoh to liberate the Israelites, and Moses replies, Me Anochi? Who am I? And similarly, George Washington had to be convinced by fellow members of the Continental Congress to become the first president. He didn't campaign at all. And it was only after the Electoral College unanimously voted for him that Washington begrudgingly accepted the appointment. In 1789, he had written in a letter, so unwilling am I in the evening of a life nearly consumed in public cares to quit a peaceful abode for an ocean of difficulties without that competency of political skill, abilities and inclination which is necessary to manage the helm. So both these forefathers resisted being called into leadership. And I'm not the first to notice these or other similarities, of course, between George Washington and Moses. I'm sure many more before me have thought about them. And I know in fact that after this first American president died in 1799, Numerous eulogies were given describing Washington as the American Moses. Eulogists elaborated on connections between the two figures from their childhoods to their military and political careers. They likened the fight for American independence to the experience of the Israelites fleeing from slavery in Egypt. Reverend John Carl of the Presbyterian Church wrote, in several instances, during the war between Great Britain and America, there were seasons as dark and gloomy as that of the Israelites, and the people were as sorely afraid. But the American Moses, George Washington, hushed the murmurs of the people, dispelled the gloom, and opened a passage through the waters. Another 
church figure, Minister Isaac Brahman, described the day that Washington was born as when kind heaven, pitying the abject and servile condition of our American Israel, gave us a second Moses, who should, under God, be our future deliverer from the bondage and tyranny of haughty Britain. So reading these quotes, I'm reminded of the deep animosity felt by early Americans toward Britain as a colonial power and the significance of independence. And it's also impossible for me to read these analogies today and not think of the actual slavery that existed in early America, of the fact that Washington himself was a slave owner, very unlike Moses the liberator. So while the analogies are telling on the one hand, they also reveal a willful, willful ignorance on behalf of the eulogists, an unwillingness to recognize the ways in which America was not yet truly free. And looking to the ends of the lives of Moses and Washington, the early American eulogists pointed out that both left a final legacy of wisdom for the people. For Moses, that wisdom is transmitted in the book of Deuteronomy, which we'll begin to read in two weeks. Deuteronomy, the last book of the Torah, is considered to be Moses's final speech. And George Washington shared his hard-won wisdom in a letter originally published in a Philadelphia newspaper. In this farewell address, Washington emphasizes the importance of national unity, of avoiding regionalism, partisan fighting, and foreign influence. Washington's farewell address is also read aloud ritualistically in the US Congress every February. Reflecting on the accomplishments of the two figures, the eulogists also consider distinctions Moses, they pointed out, died without ever reaching the promised land, but George Washington had seen its realization, the founding of America. Peter Folsom IV wrote, Moses conducted the Israelites in sight of the promised land, but Washington has done more. He has put the Americans in full possession. And Minister Frederick W. Hotchkiss recited, the American leader also ascended the mount Mount Vernon, to die. But while yielding his breath, he saw his country's glory finished. The former, Moses, dies on a mount of vision and hope, but the other on a mount of possession and enjoyment. And this is again where I have to disagree with the eulogists. Maybe it's the difference in our religious outlooks or the times in which we're living and the way our national consciousness has changed. Because yes, they are factually correct that George Washington lived to see America established. But if we accept the metaphor that America is a promised land, a land in which self-evident truths are respected, that all people are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These are the promises of our land, and they are yet to be fully realized. On some level, both Moses and George Washington must have understood the limits of their own leadership. The fact that they were part of projects much greater than themselves, which aspired to something much grander than could be accomplished in their lifetimes. And this would explain why both men met the end of their careers with a concern for the transfer of power, because they wanted to ensure that the national projects they started would outlive them when they were gone. That the people, that we, would be able to continue marching toward that promised land. In the words adapted from Michael Walzer, which appear in our prayer book, standing on the parted shores of history, we still believe what we were taught before ever we stood at Sinai's foot. That wherever we go, it is eternally Egypt. That there is a better place, a promised land. That the winding way to that promise passes through the wilderness. That there is no way to get from here to there, except by joining hands, marching together.
Shabbat Shalom.